Um, as you know, I'm Megan Taff. I'm a physical therapist here at Revolutions in Fitness, but I'm also a triathlete. Over the past couple of days, we've had the privilege of working with Matt, a uh, world-renowned endurance writer, coach, nutritionist, and athlete. Uh, I met Matt a couple of years ago when he presented at our St. Louis Tri-Team meeting, uh, and that was before I moved out here to California. Uh, but he was um, had just released his book, How Bad Do You Want It? Uh, if anybody's gotten a chance to read that, phenomenal book about um, mental skills uh, when it comes to endurance sports. Um, but again, I had just gotten this PT position out here in California, so I chatted with him a few minutes, and since he lives out here as well, we just kind of had a, a few moments as he was signing my book, and so it was just really kind of a cool moment for me since I had read a bunch of his books in the past. Um, and so just over the course of time, I started to follow him on social media, and just always super excited to watch what his endeavors were, because he always does something different every year, and it's always fun to kind of keep track of to see what he's doing. Last year, he was with the Flagstaff Elite, training like an elite, uh, marathoner and it was just awesome to watch his uh, his progress over the course of that training uh, season and then CMPR in Chica Chicago right yeah um, so you know again all of those things kind of feed back into what he typically writes or blogs about and over the course of time I've, I've used it as a huge kind of referral basis for my my patients because when they have specific questions about various things in the endurance world that I don't have answers to most of the time I could be like hey have you ever read a book by Matt Fitzgerald oh you haven't okay um, so it's been really helpful from my perspective as a therapist and and you know he'll probably be the first to tell you he doesn't know you know everything when it comes to the physical end of things and I certainly don't know everything when it comes to kind of the coaching and the the training end of things so it's just kind of a nice adjunct to have um, so ultimately when Matt, um, I saw he had signed up for I Am Santa Rosa on social media, so that kind of led to me reaching out and he uh, uh, ultimately took me up on my offer to come out here and participate in our triathlon performance optimization program. So uh, you'll see in a, in a little while, we've got a, a few slides just to kind of show you what it is, but um, ultimately it's just evaluating the swim, bike, run component and we take you through the whole biomechanical evaluation, kind of see where your problem areas are from a physical standpoint within the body and then we look at each of the three disciplines so kind of evaluating the swim stroke um, looking at the bike fit uh, and for Matt what we did is we evaluated him so he could get a tri bike you know if someone has a bike we typically get the bike on there and do a fit but um, so this one was just a little different and then of course looking at his uh, his gait analysis um, so overall, you know, our goal is to try to help him uh, achieve his goal, which is to qualify for Kona. Um, and ultimately, that's our goal for anyone that walks in through the door, depending on what your goals are. If it's to finish your first sprint or if it's to qualify for Kona, you know, ultimately we're here for you. And, and that's kind of what we're here to share with you today. So with that in mind, here's Matt. All right, thank you. Quick introduction. So um, thank you for that, Megan. Um, I can, uh, I can sell the POP, I know we'll talk about it later, but I, I went through it and it's so valuable. Um, it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 47, the last Ironman I did I was 31, um, and I want to go faster at this age than I did when I was younger, and I'm not gonna be able to do that uh, without taking advantage of resources uh, like, like those that are available here. Um, you know, I wanna do things smarter, and it starts with like, getting dialed in for my fit on my bike, um, fixing problem areas in my body. So um, I was really impressed with the experience I had yesterday and I, I'll continue to work with um, Riff all the way through the process. Um, so if you haven't tried it, do. Um, and we're ready to go here with the slides. So I'll, I'll zip through this pretty quick, like eight steps sounds like, oh my God, we're gonna be here for two hours. Uh, that's not the case, but um, you know, I, I'm, I wanted to talk, give a real nuts and bolts training talk. First of all, who here is just a runner and not a triathlete? Just a runner. So is everyone here a triathlete? Who's in, yes, we're all triathletes. Or cyclists, okay. But this is, this is, it says triathlon is relevant to all endurance sports. It's, it's just endurance training. So really it's just gonna be a, a quick um, tour of what, of like the state of our knowledge about how to train optimally for endurance sports. Like what do we know uh, in 2018 about how to train most effectively? Uh, so I'm actually, uh, Steven Seiler should be here instead of me. Steven, he wrote the foreword to this book copies of which I have available if you'd like to purchase one. He's a, an American exercise scientist who uh, is based in Norway. Um, and he's done some really cool research on endurance sports training. And he asked himself like a very fundamental question a few years ago. Um, if, if you were doing everything wrong with your training like, and you could only do one thing right, 
what's the most valuable thing you could do right? Like, you know, if you could only take one training method to the proverbial desert island, like where should you start? And if you're already doing that, then what's the second thing you should do? He just wanted to create a hierarchy of endurance training needs, like what works and in, in what order of importance. So um, if you're just beginning or if, you just, if you've been uncoached and just winging it, like what's the first, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll get that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have, it's not super important that it be readable. Um, I also have all this summarized in a blog post I wrote about this, which is on my 8020 endurance uh, website. Um, so this is what he came up with, and the guy knows what he's talking about. So um, it's eight methods that he viewed as being sort of proven both in science and in real world best practices, uh, like the things that, that the techniques that you should be practicing as an endurance athlete. And he was able to sort of rank them in importance. So bottom of the period py pyramid most important, like if you're not doing any of this, do this first, and so on. Um, so just a really cool exercise to go through because it just you know, in school, I was the one who always wanted to know, like, but why do we need to know how to do fractions? <laughs> uh, so this one, it's just a big picture look at how to train. So the, the base of the pyramid, the thing you saw on the bottom and couldn't read, um, is total frequency or volume of training. So he felt the single most important thing to do as an endur endurance athlete is train a lot. Um, now, what's interesting about that is that it's really not proven in science that it is beneficial to, to train a lot. So I say, fact, there is virtually zero evidence from controlled scientific research that high volume training is optimal for endurance fitness building. But also a fact, it is optimal. Uh, the reason that there's no proof is that it's almost impossible to do a study to prove it. Because think about it, if you want to prove that high volume training works, you have to start with currently untrained individuals people who are not fit, who are not doing anything, and then you have to, in a safe way, get them up to high volume training. That takes a long time, folks. <laughs> and science costs money, and it's hard to get funding for a study that's gonna take two years to prove what you wanna prove. So this study just simply hasn't been done, but what do we know from the real world? What do all the top athletes do? They, they train a lot. Trust me, there, there, you know, there are books out there like Run Less, Run Faster, whatever. Don't, don't believe it. Like, it doesn't mean that we all can do the 30 hours a week of training that a pro triathlete will do, but you need to train a, a lot relative to your limits. It's not, so it's not a specific number. It's like, but you, each of us needs to train a lot for us, for ourselves, and those limits change. Like, your current limit is not gonna be your limit after you've taken a sensible approach to pushing that limit back. But the most important thing you should do is train a lot relative to your current limits. Taking a step up the pyramid, I probably, this is copyright infringement, probably using that image there, but, uh, so the number one, the number two thing you should do is high intensity training. So if you're already training a lot, you should make sure to, that some of your training is at high intensity. And there's just a mountain of research proving that this is the case. And this is a very easy type of study to do. You take untrained individuals, you have half of them do, um, you know, usually they, they try to do apples to apples comparisons. So it'll be like maybe 2,000 calories worth of low intensity exercise and 2,000 calories worth of high intensity exercise spread out over a week. And then whose VO2 max improves the most after eight weeks? It's the people who do in high intensity. So if you're, if you're a beginner and you're only gonna do a little bit of something, high intensity gives you an incredible bang for the buck and it works pretty darn fast. You know, just a few weeks of high intensity intervals and you're getting fit, which is why like they've become the rage. I don't even know what this is. It's like some video series where it's all, <laughs> but it's like, you know, this, they call it HIT. You know, the acronym's H-I-I-T, HIT. And it's everywhere. It's absolutely, you know, magazines, websites, you know, DVDs or whatever. But it's valid too. Like if you're not doing high intensity intervals, you're simply not making the best use of, of the time you're putting into training. And how often do you well, it's funny you should ask that because that's slide number three. Oh. Like I <laughs> so proof that it was a great question. Uh, but so I've said you should train a lot and that you should train at high intensity. Does that mean you should train a lot at high intensity? Absolutely not. Uh, this, is, this is where we get to my book, um, 80-20. Well, why do I need to show it to you when it's right there? Um, so this 80-20 rule, actually Steven Seiler, the same researcher who's 
um, who should be here giving this presentation right now. He's the guy who came up with this 80-20 rule of endurance training. Um, and it refers to the idea that about 80% of an, end an endurance athlete's training should be done at low intensity, 20% at moderate to high intensities combined. What's the difference? He puts the critical threshold at something that's known as the ventilatory threshold, lesser known than the lactate threshold. It's actually a little bit lower than the lactate threshold. If you're like a typical trained endurance athlete, not necessarily elite, but just trained, you're talking about uh, about 78% of your, 77, 78% of your maximum heart rate. So that's like where the threshold between low and moderate is. So anything below that, you should, you should be below that about 80% of the time, above it about 20%. And this seems to be the case whether you're beginner, intermediate, advanced, uh, low volume, high volume, whatever. It's, just, it's pretty much universal. Now, there's no magic in round numbers. Does it have to be exactly 80%? No, it doesn't. But what's important to understand is that if you take Joe or Jane, in, uh, in recreational endurance athlete off the street, they're probably doing 50-50. So all of the pros are doing this, all of them because they wouldn't be pros if they weren't, <laughs> because it works better. Um, but, uh, but for various reasons that I get into in the book, if you go below the elite level, nobody's doing this. So it's a huge opportunity for improvement. So even though this is step three in the pyramid, this is the number one thing that, that most of us are doing wrong and would give us the most improvement if we got it right. Yes? This one, let's say it's like the amount or the ratio. So let's say if I run 40 miles a week, I only get eight miles for the... It's time-based. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, okay, but roughly it's like that. So should I increase the... If I want to run more high intensity, I should... Is it because people increase the total mileage or it's because you control, let's say, comparing with, a, let's say, in general, eight hours versus eight hours? I only had two hours. I only got like 1.6 hours or... Some people is doing also doing three hours, but they, they then they increase the easy. Yeah, the the way to think of it is like what, the amount of training you currently do, you're doing for a reason. It's probably it's probably lifestyle based, yeah, yeah. like it's it fits in your life. So what you want to do is just take what you're already doing and convert it to that. If I'm doing too much, I reduce it. Yeah, um, well, yeah, yeah. Don't don't even think about volume initially. If you train uh -huh. six hours a week. Yes do six hours of obeying the 80-20 rule, you will improve. And then you probably will feel great on top of that and you will think, I could actually do more. And if your lifestyle will fit it and you're motivated to, then start doing more, but don't do it all at once. Like, that's what I tell everyone. Your starting point is you're training you're training whatever many hours per week already for a reason. Start there, make this switch, and you're going to be very happy you did. And for most of us, that means slowing down on our yeah. easy days. You know, uh, it's, you know, it, trust me, you know, the, you know, the science is there. And as a coach, I see it over and over. And it takes a little buy-in. You would think it'd be easy to slow down. It's actually psychologically difficult to slow down. But um, you start to feel really good really quickly. You start to crush the workouts that are supposed to be hard. You perform better. So it's, you know, not instant gratif gratification, but the, the proof that you're, you've made a smart decision comes pretty quickly. And then, of course, the ultimate proof is on race day. And down the road, if you want to take advantage of how good you're feeling to train more, then you can get even more payoff further down the road. So that's what this book is all about. And I also have another one specific to running, 80-20 running. It gets you know, into the nuts and bolts. This isn't really an 80-20 specific talk. Um, I wanted to give like a broader picture. But this is sort of where 80-20 fits in to the period. Pyramid. It's not the most important thing, but it is the most important thing that most of us are doing wrong, uh, if that makes sense. So continuing up the pyramid, um, the next level is what's known as general periodization. So that has to do, periodization refers to what order do you do things in your training. So presumably, right, you're, you're training 12 weeks out for a race doesn't look exactly the same as you're training two weeks out from a race. Periodization is sequencing things into phases in your training in a sensible way. What Seiler has found in just in the general body of research on uh, in endurance training is that period, this is uh, Arthur Lydiard's periodization model. It's sort of like the original. Arthur Lydiard was a, a great uh, New Zealand running coach from the late 50s and on, um, who uh, he, he sort of, he modernized 
endurance sports training specific to running but it, it broadened out from there and this was the way he did it and he really sold this hard and, and he got great results tiny new zealand won three medals in distance running events in the rome olympics and you know he became world famous and you know, on it goes but since then seiler has found that the importance of periodization is a little overrated like you know there are coaches who say oh you've got to do things in this order or you won't get good results it seems to me that there's there's more than one way to skin a cat and what my philosophy is where it comes to periodization is that absolutely your training needs to evolve but the details aren't super important like there's not there's more than one way to do it i think the the rules that you that you have to obey when it comes to periodization is one your training has to get harder. <laughs> there's no other way to get fitter. Like, I mean, there's such a thing as too hard, and that's where we break out of the moderate intensity rut. Um, but in general, like if you're, if you're doing everything else right, you're not going to get fitter unless your training gets harder. It can get harder in two ways. You can train more or you can train faster. Um, and whether you should be focusing on one or the other depends more on where you are. Like in base training, typically we want to focus on training more and not worrying about intensity so much, keeping things easy because it's less stress and it makes it easier to, to train more. There are other times when you're trying to sharpen up, especially for a shorter race, when you want to maybe bring the volume down and make your training harder by um, doing more of the fast stuff or making your faster stuff, fastest stuff faster. Um, so number one is your training has to get harder and there are ways to, easy ways to measure that. Uh, so you know that your training is getting harder. The second thing it really should do that I think is important is it has to get more specific to what you're training for, right? So if you're training for say like a, a one mile open water swim, your training should get harder as you get closer to that. But if you're training for an Ironman, it should get harder in a rather different way because one is more of a sprint. You're going to be done in 25 minutes or whatever. One is pretty much an all day affair. So um, you, you want your training to look more and more like the, ra the race you're preparing for. Uh, so for something like an Ironman that I'm training for, I'm actually going to do like my shorter heart, my shortest, fastest intervals pretty far from race day because that, those things look nothing like an Ironman. They won't be the hardest workouts they do, but that's when I'm going to emphasize that stuff. When it's much closer to race day, my hardest workouts will be long brick sessions, uh, long rides and long runs where I'm actually not just going long, but pushing the intensity within either with surges or, you know, tempo segments or, you know, you know time trials or, or such so that the training is getting harder, but at the same time, it's getting more and more specific to what I'm training for. And that's true no matter what you're training for. 5K training should look different from marathon training. So number five on the pyramid here is we've talked about the importance of training in phases. That's periodization. The next thing you need to do is what S Steven Seiler refers to as sport specific micro periodization schemes. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, I say tra tra <laughs> train in cycles is basically what he means by that. And cycles means like within the overall training, say you've got, you know, you've blocked out 20 weeks to train for a half Ironman um, and you've got phases in that. But within inside the phases, you need little cycles of work and rest. Um, so what I, I typically like athletes to start with a three week cycle where week one is challenging, week two is a little more challenging, and then week three is sort of a recovery week. So it's actually easier than each of the, the, the first two weeks, sort of like a mini taper. You're not like just completely taking your foot off the gas and saying, okay, no workouts this week, but you're dialing back, you know, maybe 30% relative in workload relative to those first two weeks and then when you've you should come out of that week feeling really darn rejuvenated and then the next week you go a, another cycle of hard harder or you know challenging more challenging easy the, when i first started training for uh triathlons in the late 90s i just i had i've been a runner in high school but I, I didn't coach myself so i didn't really think about this stuff so i was training for, i think i was actually training for a marathon and i made like a 20-week plan and every single week was harder than the one before and i just destroyed myself i'm like so i'm like you know what maybe i should read a book and so i read a book and then it was like a, a joe Friel book on training and he talked about exactly this and at that point i'm like six weeks out from the marathon i'm like it's too late <laughs> i shouldn't have assumed i knew what i was doing so this stuff is really important and again and 
you know, it's not about training easier. It's about like sort of training hard, harder, you know, and then but not harder all the time. So it's not really one or the other. It's more about balancing, like knowing, you know, on your easy days, slow down. But actually, that allows you to go faster on your harder days. Same thing in on the on the weekly basis. You know, you can actually train harder in your hardest weeks if you don't try to train hard every single week. But every three weeks, some athletes can do every four. Um, but I think every three is a, uh, for, I call them step cycles, step, step down, um, is a good starting point, the three week cycle. Number six, and now, now we're getting, we're getting pretty far up the pyramid here. So this stuff is like less bang for the buck, but hey, if you're doing everything else right, might as well keep climbing the pyramid, right? So um, number six is what um, Seiler in his scientific language calls training stimuli enhancement. And he gives examples of altitude, training, heat training, and energy availability. availability. So my colloquial translation for that is uh, train in different conditions. Did you have a question? Oh, no. It's just, just like uh, training without using things or those Yes. Like yeah. Practice. Yeah. So, so this is just, you know, uh, playing with your environment in order to get a better training stimulus. So Megan mentioned I trained in Flagstaff with professional runners last year. That's at 7,000 feet. So that, that was you know, a big block of uh, uh, altitude uh, uh, enhancement. Now we would go down to lower elevations for certain key workouts. So no tool should be the only tool <laughs> in your tool chest. Um, but that, these things work. You know, they don't necessarily work for everyone and you have to know how to use them. Like heat training can be super beneficial. Um, not only if you're training for a hot race, but also actually it can, it works, training in the heat works similarly to altitude training. So if you just, if you do like all your training in, in hot weather or hot conditions, it could be indoors for say 10 days, you'll actually come out with greater blood volume. Because your body is like, wow, here's a stress that apparently is going to be repeated, so I'm going to change. And then when you come out of that, you're actually, you've got more blood to use, even if you race in, a temp in temperate conditions. So it's sort of like, a, I think of it as a, like a poor man's uh, altitude training. Because, you know, heat, you, can, you don't have to wait for summer necessarily. Um, you, could, you could train indoors. Um, and manipulate the heat that way. And then the energy availability thing is like, you know, Megan and I were talking about fasted workouts, like intentionally depriving your body of carbs, whereas normally if you want to perform, you make them available. This is, you know, it's become sort of an over the top trend that people take too far, but it is a legitimate like science backed tool that, you know, serious elite level athletes whose livelihood depends on their performance are also using, but only as a tool, not, not something they do all the time. And there are other ex examples of stimuli, um, you know, yeah, stimuli enhancement is. So this one, all the option here, it should be a small portion of that training, but not like I have the whole training. Here. Yeah, except, you know, altitude. Yeah, question? Yes, sir. He's saying these are not necessarily things you should do all the time. Um, and that's correct. Altitude is, um, somewhat of exception because it's where you live. I mean, I have slept in an altitude simulation tent, you know, you, you know, at sea level, you can do that. And it seems to be that it's not really training at altitude, but, but living at altitude that gives you the benefits. So actually the best of both worlds is to sleep, eat, and sit at high elevation and train in low elevation. So if you really want to get fancy, like that's, that's, you know, optimal, and, and there, are, there are ways of trying to make that happen. But I found it very beneficial to live at 7,000 feet and just go down for certain key workouts, especially like race specific stuff. Yeah. Number seven, we've only got two more layers of our pyramid. Uh, I've been already threatening to write a book about pacing. So if you're doing the other six things right, training at race pace, um, you, know, so get it, you know, dialing in your ability to sort of know where your limit is. So it's sort of a bit about like setting a good goal and then teaching your body to be able to actually d execute. So it's not, it's not about building the fitness to do it. It's actually, yeah, execution. It's, a, it's about, um, you know, teaching yourself to perform at the capability that you've attained through your training. Because it's very easy, it happens all the time. Athletes get fit enough to run a certain time and then they don't because they, they mess up the pacing. It's a really common problem. Uh, that's why I think I'm going to write an entire book about it because I see it over and over with athletes. It's, it's so frustrating, true. You, you know, when you have a race that you, you, knew, you knew you could have done better 
and it's just because you didn't execute. Um, you didn't do a smart race either because you didn't adapt, adjust to the conditions or you got caught up with other runners or you know, the excitement of a crowd, whatever it is. Um, this is hard, it's hard to master. But uh, if you're intentional about it, and you know, there are certain things you can do, um, it, it's a key piece. Um, Seiler rates this one as you know, potentially decisive if you've done everything else right. So again, you don't want to start. It's not the base of the pyramid. You want to, you want to nail your training so you have the fitness to work with. But um, yeah, you want to do uh, pace training to, so that you can execute on race day. Yes? So why wouldn't this be lower down, you think, more basic? Because it's easier to do. For one and two, in your in your in your intervals or whatever you're doing, down in the lower, you know, ones you'd be doing all the time, I would think you would base a lot of those off of what your race pace. Would yes, be. but but remember, yeah, I mean, on a, on a different pyramid, it would be lower down. But but the he, things are ordered in terms of the potential size of the effect. Now, if you don't train, but you're really good at pacing you're not going to have a very good race. So, you, so, so that wasn't the logic used. I, your, your point is well taken. But you need to focus on just giving your body, giving yourself the physical wherewithal to kill it on race day. It's not that you sort of wait to start doing this. It's just not, it's not as high a priority. So it should be part of what you do. Um, you know, I believe that pay, you, you can, every single workout you do should make you better at pacing. Uh, but in terms of like how you mentally sort of rank your priorities, like definitely number one is train a lot. Like if you're not, if you're currently not doing that, you're probably terrible at pacing anyway. But you're also not very fit. Um, so Matt, do you feel like a lot of these pieces kind of somewhat kind of fit in in various little places along the way in the pyramid? Because you know you could also put this back down at like the 80-20, yeah. uh, the number three, and yeah. you say you're not doing it all the time, but 20% of the time maybe this is part yeah. of your, your higher intensity yes. interval type training. Yeah. So it seems like it kind of can fit in a couple of different levels. Yeah. I mean, at a certain point, this breaks down into semantics. Like, what do we really mean by pacing training? I, I think what Siler meant is specific training sessions that are, that are focused on grooving your race pace. And so I think if that's what he is talking about, you don't want to do too much of that until you are relatively cr close to a race because, A, you don't know how fit you are. F Flagstaff was a great example because, you know, here's this middle-aged, uh, you know, serious recreational runner, but I was just, I was twice as old as all the real pros and had half the talent. Mm -hmm. And the coach didn't know what to do with me. Like, I told him, I'm like, okay, here's what I've done lately. And I was a moving target the whole time because I was doing so many things right that I hadn't been doing right before because I'm with pros. And so my rate of improvement, he couldn't keep up with it. He would write a workout based on like what I'd done last week and I would just destroy the numbers. He, after one workout, he said, is that even possible? He asked me what my last mile was. He's like, is that even possible? It's like, <laughs> apparently you're the coach. You should take the credit. <laughs> but you know, he waited until almost like a couple weeks out from the race to give me a goal pace because he just it was a he would shoot and miss because I'd already moved ahead. So that's a really good example, real world example of like you want to know where you are, um, and then uh, then it was you know it was just a few key sessions where you know it was I was training for the Chicago Marathon. He's like, okay, it's 6:05 per mile. Like that's what I think you could do. So I just a few key workouts where that's the time I aimed for. I kind of blew it a bit the first time, nailed it the second time. And then in Chicago, my, my average per mile split for for the marathon was 6:05.005 per mile. <laughs> so the stuff works, you know, if you just and it's just sprinkling, it's seasoning. You know, I did a lot of hard work, some of it at that pace, some faster, some slower. But in terms of work, like the point of the workout is to groove this pace. It was a very small part of the training and it, and it came pr pretty so, late. So when you're in Flagstaff with all these pros and that, are you doing these sessions and then doing a whole lot of just base slower miles as well? Because you'd have to be, because it sounds like the stuff that you guys would be doing would be pretty, pretty hardcore. Yeah, it was 80-20 it was training. You know, I didn't sit down with a calculator, but like, um, well, actually, I did. Like, but not 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 the whole time. You know, what I mean, I certainly wasn't second guessing this, you know, elite level coach. But I did for a couple of weeks. I'm like, does this fit? And yes, it, what was interesting about it is that most of the 20 was moderate, not not 
high intensity. So that's, you know, that 20% is not all the same thing. It could be anywhere from, you know, my, my marathon pace was a moderate intensity. I could do a fairly high volume of running at that pace, much more than I could do at 5K pace or faster. So that stuff was in the mix, but it was like, like low intensity was meat, uh, moderate intensity was sauce, and high intensity with seasoning, <laughs> if, if, if it's a recipe. So it was all there, but that's the way. But you know what, I found it like really manageable. Like I was running for me, like, you know, the real pros were running 120 miles per week, typically. Mm -hmm. I got up into the, like I think 92. I got injured halfway through. I probably would have made, I would, probably would have scared 100 miles per week. So I was doing less, but not a ton less, and, and a lot for me. But I felt great because most of it was slow, and most of the stuff that wasn't slow wasn't fast. <laughs> it was sort of in the middle. So I would do, you know, 19 mile workouts, and and then the next day have an easy run. If, and if I'd had amnesia, I wouldn't have known I'd done a hard workout the day before. So it was not. I wasn't killing myself, uh, so it was very, very interesting uh, experience. Uh, and then the top of the pyramid, scientific name is tapering, training taper. Mine translation is don't blow it in the last week. So, you know, you need to sort of like the last week matters, but it doesn't matter at all if you've done everything else wrong, right? Uh, but if you've done everything right, like there's a lot you can do to mess up a race in the last week to, to three weeks. The taper period is when you, you know, you, whenever your hardest week of training is, you start to ease off the gas from, from that point until the race. And, um, you know, there's a lot of science in this area. I can tell you, I won't get into all of it, but the most common mistake I see is actually over tapering, resting too much, taking your foot too far off the gas. Like instinctively, we think, you know, I, I want to rest up and I don't want to do anything fast. But what, what the science says is that you should bring the volume down fairly uh, aggressively, uh, but you should keep doing hard stuff. And in fact, um, really fast stuff in small doses is a really good way of priming your neuro neuromuscular system to race. It's a, you know, everything's sort of connected. And what happens is like, if you do, if you overemphasize rest during this period, your, your, your lizard brain says, oh, I'm on vacation now. And it can re lead to like this weird, like flat feeling on race day where you, you, you start off and you're like, what happened? Like I was so fit. And it's because you're, you know, <laughs> You, deep inside your brain, it, it thought this wasn't coming. <laughs> so if, if you keep some fast intervals in during the taper, uh, you're reminding your, your body, it's like, hey, you, I'm expecting you to perform uh, next Sunday. Um, so the taper is critical. Um, but again, it's the top of the period, b pyramid because it, it's not going to matter much unless you're doing the other stuff right first. And then uh, just finish up with my bonus slide. So this hierarchy of needs was stolen from a famous psychologist named uh, Abraham Maslow. So I wanted, uh, Siler gave him credit, so I wanted to give him credit. So he came up with a hierarchy of human needs. So the, the hierarchy of endurance needs is, uh, uh, owes a debt to uh, Maslow's work, which is really interesting stuff. It's like, so what we need is like food, shelter, and clothing most. And then like love is in the middle. <laughs> we, we only need love after we've got safety and security and a roof over our heads and food. And, and then number one, the, the top one is self-actualization, uh, which is what I've just done by having the uh, opportunity to like do what I'm passionate about to the benefit of other people. I hope I hope that you came away with something here. And thanks to uh, Megan and Curtis and uh, Revolutions and Fitness for giving me the platform to self-actualize uh, with you all today. That's the end of my story. I think we're, we'll actually take questions together. Now, I mentioned I have my 80-20 book. This is, this is not book signing time. I'm just letting you know. In addition to my 80-20 triathlon book, I bought a few copies of one called How Bad You Want It, which is about psychology of endurance sports, and then one called The Endurance Diet, which is about uh, the nutrition side of endurance sports. So if you want one, be happy to charge you for it and, uh, and sign it for you before I leave. <laughs> so thank you very much. Appreciate it. What's next? Questions. Is it questions? OK. Questions, yeah. So I, I thought, I didn't know. Quick, yes. The, so 80-20 room. So specific 80-20 in Do you, um, so do you look at the value of uh, training, whatever each of these things? Do you look at it in the weekly bucket, or do you kind of look at 
in the, each day that yeah good question so do, at what time scale does the 80 20 rule apply um, if you, you know, if you didn't know anything you might think okay this means uh, every workout has to be 80 percent slow and 20 percent fast that's not what it means um, the weekly scale is where it does start to make sense because think about it most of us tend to train with a weekly routine right like if you swim Monday Wednesday Friday this week you probably did it the week before and you're probably doing it the, and if, if you go to the track to run hard you know on Wednesday this week you probably do that every week so what that means is if you if you look at this week's workouts and it's 50 percent low intensity 50 percent moderate and high that means you're probably doing that every week so that that one week time scale is where it sort of matters I also liken it to like like weighing yourself too often or checking your stocks too often. It's a great way to drive yourself nuts, not a great way to lose more weight or save more money. So you, you don't want to like over microanalyze like the mathematics of your training. So that weekly time scale is good for checking in. The good news is if you do have a sort of routine and you know you're getting it right one week, that means you, you, know, you don't probably have to run the calculator every single week but you know I offer training plans where we did all the math for you and you could just follow one of those or yeah okay. but a good question that's what I'm here <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions so if you're riding and running and swimming um, I like to ride so I just like to like to ride a lot more often than I think I do to run right, right now it, it switched I used to like to run more but do you find you could do more of your high intensity in one they enjoy more i mean do you really you don't let's say swimming i only have one speed <laughs> yeah. unfortunately um so i just want to put in i guess the time the base time to be able to finish whatever distance i want to do yeah and then running or, or riding like today we did some big climbs um, and it's hard to keep your heart rate down, so those would be considered intense. Yes. So maybe, maybe I just say all my running this week is going to be low intensity because yeah. I beat myself up on the bike. Yeah. So I mean, like if you, if you're if you want to get as good as you can possibly be, like if you think if you think of yourself as a pro, um, just imagine if my livelihood depended on how I train, like what would I do? Uh, just as a thought experiment. Well, you, you would do what the Olympians and the Ironman winners do, and they're 80-20 in all three disciplines. Um, and they, but they don't spend the same amount of time in all three disciplines. The amount of time they spend in all three is roughly proportional to what you would do in a race. In an Ironman, you're on the bike for half the race, and half of your training time should be on the bike as well. So if you love cycling, that's great news. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you should do all of your high intensity in one versus you know the other there have been times when i was like in full-on runner mode but i would do a ton of cross training just because if i did all running my body would break down and i might actually have an inj injury that prevented me from doing any fast running so even though i'm training for a running event all my high intensity was on the bike it's tough to it's tough oh. to not do high intensity around here simply if you're riding your bike around yeah because what did Tim say? He said, teleport is not built flat. So everywhere you go, you're climbing up giant things. And it's Come out to the to valley. <laughs> we'll show you flat. I guess. <laughs> no, but 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 yeah. So I mean, but that so you you have to factor it in. Like at a certain point, hey, this is a hobby for most of us, and, and it's okay to be like, you shouldn't know what 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 would get you the pro results if you cared that much. But if it's not as fun for you and your livelihood doesn't depend on it, at some point just say, screw it, you know? It's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, I, I'm having fun, you know? You know, so, but it's, it's also nice to know you, you would ha have options. Like if, you're like, if you're like, you know what, I'm gonna just be super serious for 12 weeks, that there are things you could actually change and, and would give you some benefit. Like, again, that was my Flagstaff experience where like, you know, as someone who has been doing this his whole life and writes books about it, I, th I thought I'm doing most things right and I'm not like taking a lot of shortcuts and I care enough about the sport to do things the right way. And then I get around the real pros and they're doing a whole lot of, the, stuff I'm not doing and you know it 
deep in middle age, like I get better and run my fastest marathon, it was pretty eye-opening, you know. So if I, if I had room to improve by changing my methods and, and cutting fewer corners, like we all do, it's just a matter of, you know, how much does it matter to you? And, and there's no right answer to that question. You, you, should, you should be happy. <laughs> it is a hobby. You know, you should just do it in a way that you enjoy and, you know, gives you the results you want. Yes? So I read your book, Racing Weight, and this week I started using the application you have to track your, uh, the healthiness of your diet. Yes, the DQS app, DQS, DQS, DQS for Diet Quality Score. Right, yes. to track your quality. And then I was thinking about the hierarchy that you showed, um, which again is, you know, of 10 steps. Where do you rate, or where do you sort of fit in becoming leaner or more? Yeah. Uh, having the right, wait for racing into um, the bank we buck. Can we repeat the question? Yeah, so like where does, we all know that diet and, and body weight management affect performance. So, you know, where would they fit into a, a hierarchy of an athlete's overall needs? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. you're talking about things you can do. Yeah. You know, the, the way I think about it is this, like if you didn't eat at all, you, <laughs> you would not, get better no matter how much you trained, right? Um, so it's everything. Like food is the raw materials for every adaptation that occurs in response to training it, and for recovery. And it's the fuel for every workout you do. So like, it, it's like, it's the basement, it's the bottom floor. Like without it, you have nothing. That being said, I think we all know examples of athletes who are talented, train hard, have terrible diets and kick butt in, in races, right? So it's, it, it's the most important thing, but doing it perfectly isn't the most Im important thing. Y you know what I'm saying? Like, like training actually, as long as you're actually eating enough, training is more important than diet. Um, it just is. And, and there, you know, I'm a certified sports nutritionist saying that. And there are a lot of sports, sports nutritionists who would get up in front of you and claim that what I said is not true. I'm sorry, it's true. Training is more important than diet if you're eating enough. Um, not everyone does. <laughs> but but um, so there's eating enough and then there's eating optimally. And if, if you don't change your training and only go from eating enough but eating terribly to eating optimally, you will improve a lot. I keep going back to my Flagstaff example, but again, I go there and I, I thought, hey, my diet's good. I, happen to, I spent those 13 weeks living with one of the members of the team who, he showed me what eating healthy really is. Like it was just, and he, he, ate, he, he wasn't a monk, you know, he ate stuff that looked really, he loved to cook, he made delicious things, they were just delicious, super healthy things. So. You know, I weigh, I'm tall, I'm a bean pole, right? So I showed up in Flagstaff weighing 150 pounds, which is, that was my racing weight for forever. I'm like, I know this is my racing weight because I've, I've had some great races at this weight and I've been this weight for years and years and years. I did the Chicago Marathon at 141 pounds. So I lost nine pounds there and it wasn't all the diet, but I did, I, I, the guy's, the runner's name was Matt Yano. He's run a half marathon in an hour and one minute. <laughs> you, do, you were so proud of your hour and 59 minutes. We heard the story, which is a great time. Uh, an hour and one minute is just better. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I, I ate like him. Um, so, and I didn't do anything. I wasn't starving myself. I wasn't like totally refusing myself delicious blueberry muffins on occasion, but I just raised the bar a little bit by my own, you know, diet quality score standards. I just, I took the quality up a notch. I, obviously I was running more. They say you tend to lose weight at high altitude because your, your resting metabolism is a little higher. So it was a little few pieces, but nine pounds of, of weight that I didn't know I had to lose, I lost and guaranteed that was a significant factor in the improvement. I, ex I experienced there. So again, it's kind of a matter of, of motivation. Like, you know, you know, it takes some work, some psychological work to, to maintain high quality standards. It's like, do you want to do that? Do you always want to do that? It's up to you. If, like I decided for, thir for these 13 weeks, I was just going to raise the bar. I got great results. And now my diet is what you've all seen here. Uh, what was it? <laughs> Pizza with three kinds of red meat on it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, Palo Alto has been a great experience. Not so good for my waistline. 
Yes. <laughs> My wife tends to send me things she gets off of Apple News. So th today, she sent me, I think it's article, an aging marathoner tries to run fast after 40. Yeah. <laughs> 40. Yeah. So this guy, Nicholas Thompson, who tr has been running marathons, yes. his goal was to run two hours, under two hours plus his age. Right. So, and he had run like 238, you know, years before, and he was trying to run under, and he basically approached it scientifically. Yes. The reason I bring it up is that, you know, aging, you know, <laughs> yes. as we get older, uh, what people think are aging, I mean, you've probably never thought of yourself as, as aged. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, because, you know, people say age is, is only a number. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was a San Francisco 49er who got drunk and beat up an old man in down at the at wharf about a year ago. Yeah, yeah. And he was he was charged with elder abuse. And the guy he beat up was younger than me. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that made you feel bad. That made you feel terrible. Yeah. So, you know, before I went to Flagstaff, I told people, you know, people would say, well, you want a PR, like you want to, you know, run faster. And I'm like, no, that's impossible. Like, my fastest marathon was nine years ago. Like, I'm 46. Like, but, but you know, people would say, oh, I, but people that age PR all the time. And I said, not people who started running when they were 11, yeah. who did their first marathon when they were 28, who've run 40 marathons, who've already run in the top one, first percentile, you know, for whatever age they were, you know, and not people who have, have all that background and their PR is nine years old and not because they stopped running marathons. <laughs> you know, I, I had run a, a 249, my best was 241. I had run 249 earlier that year. And so I, so I felt like, hey, I'm already doing pretty well. I've only lost eight minutes. And if you look, the, the best way to to know what, what's normal is to look at single age world records. So what's the fastest marathon that's ever been run by a 30 year old? What's the fastest marathon that's ever been run by a 31 year old? That shows you what age really does to you. And so you can go right up the line. And, and so I looked at the difference between 37, which is when I ran my best marathon and 46, the age at which I started my experience, uh, experiment, nine minutes. The, the fastest marathon ever run by a 46 year old is nine minutes slower than the fastest ever run by 37. So I thought, I've already beat father time by only falling eight minutes. Okay. But it's just because I, you know, I had never trained. The thing is the fastest marathon ever run by a 38 year old or any age was an elite runner, which I never was. So because I had, I said it was impossible. Clearly it wasn't because I, I did PR, but it was just because I had never done everything right before. Yeah, but yeah, I saw that art. That, that's what that guy did. He took it as a yes. approach and somewhat did it. But right, but I thought my brother sent me that art because I'm writing a whole book about my flag stuff. You don't need to buy it now because I've given you the whole thing here. But, um, <laughs> but I thought I've been scooped because this yeah. guy is like he did the same yeah. thing. But actually, mine's much more of a human story. It was much more about like it was a magical experience, like being with these talented, hardworking kids in this beautiful place. It, I, I've. I focused on numbers. It was that journey was way more about the human stuff than the numbers were just an excuse. You know what I mean for to live out a fantasy. So anyway, that was a bit. Of, but yeah, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> yes, Curtis. I'm sorry, Curtis in back has been dying to weigh in. <laughs> Favorite ways of um, measuring VT ventilatory threshold. Yeah, so that's a tough one. I just wrote a blog post about this, like like you know saying that I think the ventilatory threshold is more important than the lactate threshold. And then so the obvious question is like, well, why are my own zones, 80-20 zones, based on lactate threshold versus like if I've just sold ventilatory threshold so hard? The main reason is like the lactate threshold was discovered 39 years or 29 years before the ventilatory threshold and science is a social institution like anything else like if you if you're there first you get all the dumplings um whatever that was a strange metaphor <laughs> yes 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 is that pizza still back there um yeah so the lactate threshold was discovered first and it's easier to measure 
uh, you know, if, has anyone, raise your hand, if, have you ever done like an invasive lactate threshold test where they do the pin pricks? Of course you have, Curtis. No need to raise your hand. Uh, but thank you, because someone had to. Um, ventilatory threshold, it, it, you, have, you have to like breathe into a mask. And there's like this giant machine like um, measuring your exhaled gases. So the technology is just not really doable. For, fortunately, there's, there's a very consistent mathematical relationship between lactate threshold and ventilatory threshold. So if you measure your lactate threshold, you just have to do a formula and you pretty much can know what your ventilatory threshold is. Though there are new technologies coming around that allow you to get a better like sort of like an in the field estimate of your ventilatory threshold. I'm testing a wearable right now. It's actually, it's a shirt you wear, it's a tight fitting shirt and it has um, a sensor in the back. It's actually um, uh, an accelerometer. Uh, the same thing that you can use to measure your running pace if you don't do the GPS method. Like if you've ever worn a thing on your shoe um, or even step counters, some of them use an accelerometer. And it just, um, so when, when it's, you wear this shirt, it's actually measuring how much uh, your lungs are inflating and collapsing when you breathe and also the rate. And that actually allows you, so you're not measuring the gases directly, but you can get a very good estimate of your breathing rate through this wearable. So I'm really hot in this because I would love the, to, for there to be a paradigm shift. So we're actually measuring what truly does matter more. The reason the ventilatory threshold matters a lot is that when you start out at a low intensity and go up, 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 and then cross this ventilatory threshold, there's a, the reason it's called ventilatory threshold is that there's an abrupt spike in your breathing rate right there. It's not so abrupt that you're really all that conscious of it, but if you're breathing into one of these machines, it's, it's very noticeable. It's a threshold, you know, and you cross it and the math says it. Um, and the reason you start breathing uh, noticeably harder, well not noticeably, but mathematically harder there is that um, the faster you go, the more muscle fibers you have to recruit in order to keep up with the demand for speed. And at a certain point, you need to start recruiting fast twitch muscle fibers or type two muscle fibers. And when that happens, a different part of your, the motor centers, your brain has to kick in and ask those because th th it's, it's all wired from here, right? So, and this is all your nervous system. So when you cross that threshold and you're uh, calling on more type two muscle fibers, you're taxing your nervous system a lot more. So even though you, if you go from just barely below the threshold to just barely above it, the, the post-workout recovery time need is much greater because you've tired out your nervous system a lot more. This is why that threshold matters a lot. So when I tell people they need to slow down to get faster, I'm not saying you have to go from, you know, 10 minutes to, to per mile to 14. Sometimes you just need to slow down a little bit. If you're just above that threshold, you can, you can get just to the other side of it and it makes a, a huge difference in how much you're uh, stressing your nervous system and therefore how easy it is to recover from it. Very long answer to a simple question. And, and sort of I was going to ask a similar question. So do you exclusively use the accelerometer or can you make relations with power meters and heart rate monitors and RPE yep. to know what, how that Yeah, relates? absolutely. You can correlate any any of the standard metrics to it. So, because it, you don't, I mean, your ventilatory threshold is a rate of oxygen consumption. Nobody trains by that, right? So you're going to want to correlate it with something. So the sensible ones would be power. If you're a cyclist, you can also do power now for running. Uh, pace for running is reliable. Um, uh, heart rate. Is, yeah, could, you can use in almost any discipline. And you know, even perceived effort, you know, there's something to be said for just being able to do it by feel. Um, so yeah, that's what you want to do. It's like, because the, the, the actual rate of oxygen consumption, it's like, I don't care. Uh, yeah, so yeah, correlate it with something that you actually use out on the road or wherever it is you train. Another good question. If uh, I could borrow Matt maybe for one quick demo to kind of uh, demonstrate a couple things that we did. Oh no, um, yeah, don't ask me to balance. Show them, show them where your problems are. <laughs> um, just talking to you briefly about our uh, performance optimization program or our POP. Uh, this is what we took Matt through and this is what we're offering to uh, everyone um, as one of our services. And so ultimately um, what we try to do is um, kind of look at the nuts and bolts um, of various sports. And it doesn't necessarily have to apply to endurance sports, although that is kind of my particular area of expertise. But, you know, we see dancers and, you know, 
throwers, baseball players, that type of thing. So we can break down pretty much anything. Um, but ultimately, it's a way for us to kind of help somebody improve upon, work towards certain goals, um, depending on whatever their sport is. Um, so keeping them injury free and then just, again, working on overall performance. Um, so our POP includes um, movement specific um, analyses. So we definitely will take you through like a specific movement analysis, break down the different joints, things that are most appropriate to whatever your sport is. Uh, and then we take those uh, and we turn them into exercises, mobility type drills and various ways to make you more successful. Um, so in just a moment, I'll kind of show you one thing that we um, found with Matt, a kind of very important key component um, that's gonna be very uh, important for his triathlon career. Um, so, we have our uh, newly um, added swim stroke analysis that we've started to do. Um, and it's a, a GoPro camera in the water. We have a couple different views that we take. Um, so it's actually quite a bit of fun. It's probably, probably one of the most fun things that I do here now. Um, but ultimately, we can, we can show you in real time what your swim stroke looks like. Um, and it's just a fun little contraption. We get lots of questions when we go to the pools. What are you know, little ladies doing their aerobics classes? What are you guys doing? So um, we usually just get a lot of attention, which, you know, of course, we, we eat up. Um, but ultimately, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a master swimmer, a triathlete, an open water swimmer, you just like to go swim for fun. I mean, it's definitely a great way to look at your form. And, uh, you know, people will tell us all the time, well, you know, I have a master's coach on deck and they tell me A, B, and C, but I don't know what they're talking about. And so ultimately, when you see that video in front of you, you can actually see what you're doing wrong and it's 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 pretty obvious right yeah yeah so all right and then of course um, I'm working on those um, so please please like the revolutions and fitness Facebook page because ultimately we will be uh, doing the analysis where I uh, kind of talk over the video to kind of say what the problem areas are uh, but that is definitely something that will be kind of getting going on social media sometime soon and of course Matt gets his full analysis um, so he'll have that to refer to time and time again and then hopefully you know maybe in a couple of months he comes back to see us we look at a few things you know he's got some exercises and some drills to go along with it and then hopefully we see that improvement uh, in the swim stroke and uh, his feet don't sink quite as much um, okay, so bike fit, um, you know, we've got a couple of different ways and we have, uh, you know, our rock star Gustavo on, on film here. Um, so we can do bike fits. Uh, we can also help out those who are looking to get a bike um, because we have what we call a fit bike. Um, so we can take measurements, make adjustments, kind of get a, an appropriate assessment of what is comfortable for you. And you can take those measurements then to whoever your uh, bike shop is or if you're ordering something online and you can just take those numbers to buy the right size bike for you. Uh, and then ultimately, as, as Matt kind of experienced, you know, it's something that can evolve over time as well based off of what you end up doing from uh, kind of an exercise perspective, mobility, strength, flexibility, those things are all fluid type things. So we, we chatted about a couple of options. I think Justin had mentioned the particular bikes that you were looking at had the ability to um, you know, increase or decrease whatever it was that your body uh, hopefully will change in the next couple of months and you'll have the ability to make those adjustments without a problem. So. And then last but not least, um, the run analysis, kind of finding out where your problem areas are, hopefully preventing injury. Um, so we have kind of the surround cameras to look at you from a couple of different views. And then of course, putting pressure inserts in the shoes to see one, if you're kind of undecided as far as if the shoe is right for you, it's a great way to, to take a look at, see uh, you know, if this is a, a good shoe from a pressure perspective. Uh, I had a gentleman come in uh, a couple weeks ago who um, really loved his clouds because they were fast and it was a lightweight shoe but man, his pressure sucked. He also brought his hokas because his feet feel significantly better and the knees when he runs in his hokas. So we did both of the pressure mapping on the two shoes. And of course his pressure was significantly um, improved when he was in the hokas, just the overall distribution in the foot. And so we kind of came up with the hypothesis that he should be doing a majority of his training in the hokas. And then, you know, maybe some short kind of drill speed work, um, 5K or less, something like that in the clouds. And so it was good for him to see because he was kind of a personality where I think he probably would have just continued to go in the clouds had we not said anything. Because it just, he liked feeling fast and he liked the weight of the shoe and he didn't really care that, yeah, it caused a little bit of knee pain when he wore them. But I think we kind of came up with a good solid game plan for him. Um, okay, so um, I'll tell you what, if uh, maybe can we all get up and relocate for a minute? Yeah. Let's head back to this very last table because it's adjustable. 
ultimately, one of the biggest things we saw with Matt's evaluation yesterday was his limitations in core strength. Um, and as you're aware, triathlon, two out of the three sports are very much so an overall kind of um, upper body slash lower body. You know, cycling, of course, it's going to be more lower body. You do need quite a bit of core strength, especially in an aggressive tri position. But um, just the overall balance between the upper body and the lower body when it comes to uh, swimming and running. So, Matt, what I'm going to have you do, I'm going to have you stand with your back. I was um, afraid it was going to be this one. Yeah, sorry. So, ultimately, this first test that we do, um, it's a combination of things. We're all testing core strength as we do this. So the first part, I'm actually simulating gravity. So Matt, you're gonna stand nice and relaxed for me. Just don't let your knees buckle. And so I'm gonna start to give you some pressure through the tops of your shoulders. And again, you're just gonna stand relaxed. So I'm slowly starting to apply some pressure. Can you feel that sensation in your back when you buckle back? Yep. And so ultimately, as I press down on the top of Matt's shoulders, I should feel very solid, kind of like a tree trunk. His core muscles are kicking in, they're protecting his back and his spinal column. Um, but as I start to get to, we'll call it like a, maybe a two out of five pressure, almost a three out of five, I start to feel that buckle. So again, I start real light. This is a one out of five pressure, two out of five. And then right before I get to the three is when I start to feel a little bit of that backward bend in the spine, okay? And that's something usually you can feel pretty easily um, as I'm testing you because it's, it's a pretty obvious sensation. Now, yeah, he, he was buckling into extension. Okay. So now for the next one, you're going to stand tall and this time you are going to resist me. All right, I'm going to give you some pressure through the front of your shoulders and go ahead and resist. Okay. So it wasn't really a lot of pressure for him to start shifting his weight back into the heels. Did you guys see him rock back pretty, pretty quickly? So from a pressure perspective, if I rate this as a one out of five, and then I don't even get to a two out of five before he starts to buckle backwards. I'm okay? top heavy. <laughs> well, so tell him the analogy from yesterday. You, you feel yes, like a- Yeah, because a lot of what I heard confirmed just my own experience in my body and I have always felt, I'm a writer so I think in metaphors, I've always felt I, I am a too tall stack of dishes. You know, just think of a waiter with like plates like here, like that's how I feel just in my life. <laughs> so it wasn't, I, it wasn't surprising. That and I, I mean, it was a very great analogy just based off of what we tested with the core yeah. strength because he was so limited and through, you know, kind of the midsection trunk flexors, trunk extensors. And so then you start to think to yourself, well, someone who is such a high level athlete, mm -hmm. how have they gotten to this point and, and how have, how, you know, how are they functioning at this point? And then Matt makes the comment, I get injured very easily. Well, guess what? It's because his core is really weak. Okay, now we're gonna do one more. Same thing from behind, you're gonna resist me. Here's a one pressure. And then again, I don't even get to the two pressure and he starts to buckle forward. So the trunk extensors are pretty weak. Um, so I wanted to take a moment and just do one quick core exercise. We didn't get to this yesterday, so this will be new right, for yeah. you. And this will be a good take home for you to start doing, okay? Um, can, some, can you guys grab me a couple pillows maybe for the table? All right, so now what you're going to do is you're going to slowly let go of your knees right about here. You're going to keep your hips, your knees, and your feet flexed, okay? So flex those legs up for me. And what we're going to do, this first part is just a little bit of a test. We're going to hold this position, and I'm going to apply a little bit of a gentle traction up towards the ceiling. And we're just going to play a little game. How long can Matt last? And so what's going to happen initially is you're going to feel your hip flexors first okay, because those are the predominant muscle that are gonna keep you in this uh, position. But over time, that muscle's gonna fatigue, and we actually want it to. So we wanna get to the point where the hip flexors get out of the equation, and you start to kick in some of the deeper core muscles, okay? Your job at this point is not to try to overpower me, but just to maintain the position and to continue to breathe. And if anybody wants to keep an eye on the clock, we'll just kinda see how long Matt can hold this, and it's, uh, it's kind of up to you to tell us uncle, okay? <laughs> All right. I think this is going to hurt. <laughs> Maybe a little. <laughs> Maybe a little. Okay. So as far as pressure is concerned, I'm not really applying a lot of pressure. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So just a, a slight traction up towards the ceiling more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really not trying to kill each other. Um, I'm not applying so much pressure that I'm breaking him, and he's not uh, trying to counteract me so much that he's, uh, you know, just absolutely holding his breath, or he does look kind of <laughs> intense at the moment though. Um, but again, your job is to just continue to breathe, okay? 
So right now you're probably feeling a lot of uh, muscle burning sensations going it's on in your flexors. It's not too bad, actually. I, I think I could hang you out You could hang out I here all day? <laughs> oh, man. You, you might need to pull so We're going to be here for a while, guys. <laughs> Grab another water. <laughs> And the reason is, I actually do this exercise every day. Do you? <laughs> uh, All you got to do is say uncle. <laughs> it's my competitive side. <laughs> All right. All right. That's enough. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. So Boy. ultimately, Matt's going to stay in the same position. And he's going to apply the pressure by using his hands on each right. respective thigh. Well, what's, sore, what's sore right now? My head, because it was all willpower. <laughs> no, that was, was a just, completely wrong muscle. Okay. Yeah, just it's all this. Not your, not your hip flexors. Yeah. So uh, that's the thing, because the hip flexors will fatigue out, and then ultimately, then those deeper abdominal flexors are going to start to kick in, mm. which is really what we're more interested in more than anything else. But I it can't is. Get up. <laughs> <laughs> You're just stealing it down. It's cool. Um, but yeah, so if anybody wants to give this a try, we can move some chairs out of the way because it's a really powerful exercise. Um, but ultimately, I'm going to have Matt do this two more times using his own pressure with his hands, and we're going to hold for about 45 seconds or so. Okay, so not quite as long as what we were doing before. And then I can time you for it if you like. Am I in the right position? You are in the right position. You're going to keep hips, knees, and feet. That's the important part flexed up because it's that whole anterior or front part of the body, you're working all the flexors at the same time. My coworker did this on me a while back and I had, had done a, a fairly long run in the morning and my anterior tibs were screaming. So you'll definitely feel quite a bit. All right, so you are almost 30 seconds in. And of course, never holding your breath. There's a couple veins that are popping out though, so just... Uh, <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Hug your knees to your chest. Relax for a moment. Ugh. You seriously are going to have to lift me off this <laughs> table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this will be a fun one tomorrow. All right. You're going to have to lift me out of bed tomorrow. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I feel another story coming on. Um, okay, so let's do one more rep, okay? Whoops. Wrong way. There you go. All right, so 45 seconds, and then we're actually going to retest his uh, core strength and see what it looks like. Unfortunately, that will require you getting up off of the table. So quiet. 30 seconds in. So you've done this at home without the thing on, under your butt. Yeah. It's a lot harder that way. Yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> the pillow is assisting you, so once you get a little stronger, you can uh, definitely do it without the pillow. Uh, doing this one, so my hip flexor Relax. is just getting silent. Is that normal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I easily, so easier to oh. engage those stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, and it's such, a gr it's such a powerful exercise for both areas, but ultimately the whole point is to fatigue out the hip flexors eventually, but you still get the benefit of contracting them initially. Okay, so now and you're going to look straight ahead, you're going to stand relaxed, and then again, just don't let your knees buckle, okay? Okay, all right, now, Matt, what did you feel when I did that? Uh, more, uh, I don't know, like not a tall stack of dishes, like I was more centered on my feet. Okay, so you felt more stable. Yeah. So that's exactly what I was feeling. So I actually gave him a significantly greater amount of pressure through the tops of his shoulders compared to the first time. Because really the first time it just took a second and then all of a sudden he had already buckled, right? Uh, but this time, so again, if you're looking straight ahead, standing relaxed, I'm going to grade it. This is a one out of five pressure. Two, three, four, five. Okay, he's not budging. Okay, now let's go ahead and try 
the other two. Obviously, I didn't just get stronger. Is it because I'm using the muscles I wasn't using before? Yes. Oh, okay. You, you made a connection for the brain to connect to the muscle. Okay, and before it wasn't connecting. So it wasn't so much that you were weak per se, it just your body had not made that neuromuscular connection. Okay. Because I do a ton of core. Well, so the question <laughs> is, you know, are you doing the right core exercises? And the answer is probably not. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this kind of being the first step of many um, that you would want to try to achieve getting this, the core a little bit stronger. Okay. Now, again, feet are going to be shoulders width apart, standing up nice and tall. This time you are going to resist me. And starting with the pressure through the front of the shoulders, here we go. I think I'm going to still suck at this. Okay. All right, let's try that again. Okay. So you still tip backwards, but you actually get, I push a little harder before you get there. So let's grade that. Go ahead and stand tall. And you're going to go ahead and resist. One out of five. Two out of five. And then kind of two, almost three is when you start to buckle back. So you did move up one muscle test grade, which is actually a pretty significant change after only doing like, what, two minutes worth of exercise, okay? A very painful exercise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now same thing from behind. Again, you're gonna resist my pressure. Okay, so again, he still tips, but I actually gave him a little bit more pressure this time around. So if we're grading it, here's a one out of five, here's a two, and again, as we're getting closer to that three, that's when you start to buckle. So I'd give you about a two plus out of five. So again, you're still, you're still making progress. <laughs> Story of my okay? life. Um, so <laughs> biggest one for me, which is super important, is that first one where I'm giving you the pressure through the tops of your shoulders because in essence, every time you hit the ground when you're running, um, guess what? That's four to six times your body weight going through the spine. And if you don't have the muscle strength to back it up, well, yeah, you're gonna fall apart all the time. Um, so he was able to engage significantly and I could give you that five out of five pressure and you didn't collapse under my pressure, which is huge, mm -hmm. okay? The, stuff, the other stuff will come with time, it just takes more repetition of doing it.